Good evening, welcome to the show. Steve Price in for Andrew Bolt again tonight. As Australia gets ready, I guess you can say, it gets ready to shut up shop unless you're in retail for Christmas 2023. Let's get into it. Here's what's coming up on the program tonight. Is the Australian Navy really so ill-equipped to not be able to back our US allies when they ask? Ships that are aged, unable to repel dangerous killer drones. What a sad tale that is. Barnaby Joyce, uh, the Deputy Nationals leader is coming up. He'll join us shortly. Uh, devastating pictures out of far north Queensland of the damage that rain has caused in the wake of Cyclone Jasper. Now, we've had roads swept away, landslides, massive damage. We'll get the latest from the Port Douglas Mayor. Plus, we reach out to the Mayor of Lismore, Steve Krieg, to find out exactly how long it takes to recover from a natural disaster like that. And finally on the ground assessment of how hard the cost of living crisis is biting around Australia. The Salvo's Brendan Nottle with a not very happy truth telling will join us as well. But first up, a question I posed in a newspaper column, The Herald Sun, a week ago, which this week alone and today in particular has been proven to be true. Australia, in my view, is sadly lacking in anything re representing leadership in politics at all levels, federal, state and local. Now, to prove my point of what weak leadership looks and sounds like, I give you Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles. Watch this and weep. We won't be sending uh, a ship or a plane. Uh, that said, we will be almost tripling our contribution to the combined maritime force. Right now, we have uh, five personnel who are embedded in the headquarters of the combined maritime force. Uh, and over the next month, that number will increase to 16. Um, that is a, a, a significant contribution. It's one which is commensurate with uh, like-minded countries. This bloke seriously tried to tell Kieran Gilbert on Sky today that no, we were not sending a warship to the Red Sea as the Americans asked, but Miles, with a straight face, as you just saw there, claimed we were tripling our military assets in the region. Tripled. From five people to 16. Miles then labelled it a significant contribution. They're his words. Are we watching an episode of a Utopia or Yes Minister? Surely this bloke doesn't even believe this stuff himself. And what exactly are these 16 people doing? Presumably not trying to kill terrorist pirates who threaten the area where 27% of the world trade passes. I mean, perhaps they are skilled drone pilots. I don't know. But what this debacle has told average Australians, we, and both sides of politics, I should say, are to blame here, we have a dad's army of a navy. I mean, respected defence experts who have been warning of this for decades made it very clear that our fleet is old and in many instances it's clapped out. Our ships don't have any of their own armed drone repelling hardware. And one expert I heard this morning, and I have no reason to doubt him, said we would have to use missiles worth a million dollars each to shoot down a thousand dollar drone. This is what lack of leadership looks like in real time. How could an island nation in the middle of Southeast Asia with a hostile China to our north be so badly under-equipped? Well, here's one glaring reason and a reason that makes our refusal to send a Navy ship that the Americans asked for even more alarming. Prime Minister after Prime Minister, federal government after federal government, when they looked at the bottom line, the budget, and came to investment in military hardware, came to the conclusion that, ah, don't worry, if we get in real trouble, the Americans will come steaming across the, the Pacific to save us, like they always have. It will be the ba battle of the Coral Sea all over again. Look, I find it depressing that a nation like Australia, with our proud, proud Anzac tradition, the country that delivered magnificently in both world wars, just think about the Rats at Brook or John Monash on the Western Front, a nation that sent SAS forward Special Forces troops deep into Afghanistan before the Americans even got there, or the brave diggers of Vietnam. It's a sad day for our proud military tradition. A lot of vets will be listening to this and agreeing, I'm sure. I'll leave the last word for a man who knows all about bravery, former Special Forces soldier and now Shadow Defence spokesman, Andrew Hastie. They're sending sick people 
to Operation Prosperity Garden to be staged in Bahrain, in Bahrain, where the real work is going to take place in the Red Seas along with other naval contributions. The UK, for example, is sending a destroyer, the French are sending a frigate. Um, we've always stepped up over the last hundred years when we've had to, to be a good global citizen, to uphold uh, the global rules-based order. And the Prime Minister has squibbed this. It's a weak decision, and that's why we're calling on him to reverse it, because it's in our national interest to contribute. If we want others to help us in a time of need, we need to step up and reciprocate now. What an impressive man Hasty is. Look, let's turn our attention now to the floods in Queensland. We can't forget the people up there. Now, communities north of Port Douglas remain cut off. Massive road damage. Uh, Port Douglas itself, while up and ready to welcome tourists back, can't be accessed along that coastal highway, the Captain Cook Highway. You need to actually go out through Mareeba, which if people want to get to Port Douglas, that's a good way to go. It's a, not a bad drive, and hopefully they can get through that way. Communities further north are relying on air support, actually, to fly supplies in. Take a listen to some of the locals in that part of the world and how they are coping. We just ended up with a set back, what, five or six days worth of rain. It was just biblical, really. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like it. There's no immediate shortage of food, but there's going to be if, if people, uh, if, if the road doesn't open. Now all we've been doing is scrapping that mud and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. On our hands and knees scrubbing the floors, trying to get all the mud out. Businesses have already closed. The Mossman Mill, this is enough just to de devastate it and probably Mossman will never recover. So I say to Albo, I say to the new Premier, come up here, meet the people in Mossman. Pictures on Sky Today showed empty shelves at the Woolworths in Mossman. That's just shocking. Joining me now is Port Douglas Mayor Michael Kerr, who I get a sense from watching him over the last few days is uh, an optimistic man. G'day, Michael. Nice to talk to you again. Yeah, it's nice to see you again. Uh, I like the smile on your face, and I agree with you. If you've got a, uh, a holiday booked in Port Douglas, which is one of the great places of the world, you can go out through Mareeba. Is that road OK? I know it takes a bit longer, but can you get through that way? You can get that way through that way. We've currently just got to close because we're trying to get the emergency services and the trucks through. As you said, you saw Woolworths with the shelves empty. We need to get those trucks through now. And we had about 50 trucks, I think it was, using that road today to get through. We don't want anyone on it that may have an accident and cut it off for another five days. Let us get the emergency services. Let us get us the big trucks through that's going to do all this clearing work. Let us get this food and all the perishables through that we need. And then we'll open it up for the public to use. We spoke yesterday and asked you about, you know, the road damage. I'm going to talk to to uh, to the, the poor old Lord Mayor of uh, the Mayor of uh, Lismore, who you know had to go through this 22 months ago, Steve Krieg, and uh, his big problem was roads. Uh, how hard is it going to be to get Captain Cook Highway opened up? And what about the rest of the roads in your shire? Yeah, it's going to be. Hard. It's going to be a long road. And I actually had a really good conversation with him last night. He gave us a call to tell us about his experiences. So I'll certainly be making phone calls with him and keeping in touch. But it's going to be a long road um, to get the long road. There's irony in that uh, to get that fixed. Uh, but we will do. And as I said last night, you know, as long as we've got access to Port Douglas, the people can still get here. Maybe they'll stay longer if it's harder to get out. You've got uh, food issues there or you're getting stuff through OK? The stocks are all starting to come through. We had our first Coles truck come through yesterday morning, so Coles got their full, full share of food. Uh, Woolworths are getting theirs now. They, I saw the big truck as I was driving down now, heading towards Woolworths. So, you know, the food is starting to come through. Um, the only issue we've got currently at the moment is a water supply issue. Uh, hopefully that will be fixed tonight, maybe tomorrow, definitely by the weekend. To keep the fingers crossed that we're going to solve the water issue and then, uh, you know, we'll at least be... Uh, a lot more comfortable than what we are at the moment. Let's just uh, go a bit further north. Um, you know the area much better than me, but uh, you go, you know, past uh, uh, the Daintree and up to Mossman. Where is the really uh, the area that you've got real concerns about now? 
So once you actually get across the river, um, there's, a, there's a stretch there. We've actually divided basically the Daintree into three separate areas now because of landslides. So you've got uh, the Forest Creek Road area in Cape Kimberley. Then you've got the Cow Bay area. And then you've got another, you've got a massive big landslide just before Cow Bay. You've got another massive landslide just before Cape Tribulation. So the three areas are completely separated. They can't get to each other. Um, and it's going to be major work. The one that's stopping Cape, but just before Cape Tribulation is at least 110 metres wide. It's a huge drop, and that one's going to certainly take some geotech specialists to make that work. I'm sure when you were talking to Steve, uh, you would have got some advice on how you deal with senior politicians who fly in and how you, you, you nail them to the cross and, and actually get what they say they're going to promise. Did he give you some advice on that? And what are you going to tell the PM when you see him? <laughs> well, it's, a, it's my motto as well, and him and I have got a very much in agreement in that you don't take no for an answer. This is what I need, this is what my people want, and you keep knocking on their door until you get it. And so he's going to be there when? Tomorrow he's expected, along with the Premier? I believe so. Nothing's been confirmed with my office yet uh, of their visit. Um, we're just going by people saying that the, both the Prime Minister and the Premier are supposed to be around this region tomorrow. So uh, if you had another message to the good folk of uh, the rest of Australia about visiting, um, what would it be? I mean, I, I know you're very optimistic about this. What would you be saying? No, I'm still saying the same thing. You know, we're, we're having a couple of issues right now with Port Douglas as far as water concerns, but there's nothing else wrong with it. So, you know, get past Christmas. You know, we are going to be open and trading again. We really do need the business because, you know, the last thing I want for this community is another massive... Uh, crash in our economy through tourism. As that uh, person did say, the mill's now currently in administration, so we're trying to sort that as well. You know, economically, we just couldn't afford this right now, and, you know, it's the worst time being Christmas as well, so it's hit people in the hearts, the brains, the morals, the finance, the, wa the wallets, everywhere it's, it's getting us right now. So we really need those tourists to keep coming, you know, once uh, the sun's shining in a couple of weeks' time. You won't even know that this has happened in Port Douglas, I can tell you right now. I had a very pleasant Anzac day up there a couple of years ago and won a lot of money in the Iron Pub in the main street. I've got very fond memories of that, I've got to tell you. Yeah, they do a good two up there. <laughs> do they ever. Michael, good luck with it all. Thank you again, Michael Kerr there. As I said, I wanted to catch up with Steve Krieg. Now, he's someone who knows better than most what happens to a community after a once-in-a-lifetime flood event. Uh, he was in charge in Lismore. Uh, 22 months ago when they had a, a flood event that has been the biggest in that area's lifetime. I've lost count the number of times I've talked to Steve after his community got smashed in February last year. He joins me again. So good to see you again. Uh, and, you know, I asked last night for us to get in touch to talk to you today. I didn't realise that you'd been on the phone to your colleague up in Port Douglas. Yes, Pricey, good to see you again, mate. Uh, yeah, it's important to to reach out you don't know really who's uh who's your friend and who's your foe in in times like this and i just thought it'd be important just to reach out and have a bit of a chat and make sure they're okay it's can be a lonely place uh when you when you're leading a community through this so just wanted to reach out and say good day. Well, I think one of the great things about you, Steve, is that you straightened up the politicians. You were very forthright with them. You respected their office. You respected who they were as individuals. Uh, but you got into a conversation and you got promises out of them. Tell me, please, uh, and we haven't spoken for a little while, that uh, most of those promises have actually been met. Pricey, you and a few of your journo mates need to probably come to Lismore early next year and, and just have a look and see what hasn't been done. Uh, you know, we as you said in the intro, we're 22 months on from what is uh, financially the biggest disaster in Australia's history. I wanted to ring the mayors up north uh, just to, to say good day and reach out and know that they're not alone. But Lismore is is by far and away the biggest natural disaster in Australia's um, history post-settlement. And, you know, I had Murray Watt here a couple of weeks ago who is doing his best, and I don't, I don't hold the politicians to account so much as the bureaucratic levels that, 
you know, I can't I can't take you anywhere in Lismore to show you one piece of physical infrastructure that's been built 22 months on to protect Lismore residents from the vision that you're seeing on your screen now. Uh, having said that, we have opened the first major landslip uh, repair on, on the main road between Lismore and Nimbin today, a uh, $19.5 million repair job there. But we've still got 149 of those to go. Uh, those sorts of road repairs. So we're about to sign um, the biggest disaster recovery, disaster recovery funding agreement between state, federal and local government uh, early next year, hopefully, to the tune of about $900 million to get our city back to where it needs to be. But we're early days into what is going to be a decade-long recovery. I'll try and come up and do the program from there next year. But hang on a minute. that You were told flood mitigation would be a priority and it would be built. It hasn't been? Uh, no. Uh, and you will recall back in February of this year, I stood shoulder to shoulder with Murray announcing $50 million in, in quick fix, as they call it, flood mitigation projects. Uh, things like upgrading our levy pumps, which one of our levy pumps still op is operated by a tractor. Our council staff have to dry a tractor, hook a PTO shaft up to it to operate a pump. Uh, you know, we're still haggling over money, trying to get that. Um, and, you know, we've had 100 mils of rain today. Our community's still a bit tense and a bit wary of, of heavy rainfall like we've had today. And as you say, 22 months on and we're still waiting to upgrade our pump network. But I can get an ice cream, can't I? Oh, yeah. Norco's open. <laughs> <laughs> That's good news. And, Steve, and great to catch up with you. You've done a fantastic... <laughs> yes, Sorry, mate. I, I will just say that the private sector has been amazing. Organisations like Norco and, and you know, our, our industrial estate, we're all getting things done in spite of um, state and federal government support, not with them. And uh, we really need to form this relationship. I love the Queensland model. Uh, I wish it was in New South Wales, but, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. We'll keep in touch, Steve. It's really good to uh, see your face again, mate, and I'll try and make it up there in the new year. Thank you very much for that. That's Steve Craig doing a great job there in Lismore. Now, after the break, more on the Red Sea saga. I'll talk to Nationals MP Barnaby Joyce and find out why China is praising the decision that we didn't send a ship to the Red Sea. Welcome back, Steve Price in for Andrew Bolt on this Thursday before Christmas. Now, Defence Minister Richard Miles, as we saw at the beginning of the program, has confirmed that Australia will not send a warship, as asked by the Americans, to defend one of the key trade routes in the world in the Red Sea, rejecting a request from the US, up to six additional ADF personnel instead will be deployed to assist in the operation. So Richard Miles, here he was today defending the decision while speaking exclusively to Sky News' Kieran Gilbert. This is a decision not being made on the basis of, of, of capability in that sense. This is a, a decision being made on the basis of where our strategic focus needs to be. We still have very significant capability within our Navy. I must say the Minister does not fill me with any confidence at all now. Joining me now is Nationals MP Barnaby Joyce. Are we living in some sort of a, a sick joke here, Barnaby? I mean, we had, we had the Defence Minister having uh, the gall to stand up and say we're tripling uh, our resources in the Middle East. He's going from six people to 15 in Bahrain. Well, I'm sure that'll keep the hoodie revel, revels at bay, won't it? I mean, we've got these people, so just so Australians know, like, if you have a look at it, you've got, I suppose you've got England there, you've got the United States over there. Uh, they can trade, but for us to trade, we have to send things through the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal. And when the, our Defence Minister, Richard Marle, says that we're not sending a warship, the questions that have to be asked is, is that because we don't want to, we're not capable of it? Uh, we don't think it's important. What What is your reasons as to why we're not sending a warship? This is absolutely 100% in our national interest because we trade. We need to use 
that sea lane. That is, a, that is so important, paramount to Australia's interests. And um, it's not just the vast Australia, the vast, so many countries around the world. And we've just gone to them and said, oh, it's really important we have AUKUS, it's really important. You know, we're great, we're great allies. You know, we need those nuclear submarines. And we really, really do. We really do. And those, you know, the Americans say, well, by the way, can you send up a, a ship to help us out in the Red Sea? And we go, uh, no, what we're going to do is send a few people to your office in Bahrain. We'll send it because that, mate, that'll have the Houthi rebels, rebels hopping. They'll be... By the time they feel out, find out that we're sending six or seven more people, 12 more people to an office in Bahrain, mate, that will stop immediately. You reckon this is politics or is it uh, a budget decision? Is it that the Navy doesn't have the resources? I mean, both sides of, of government are being guilty of not spending enough on defence. We'd have to accept that. But every time we've been asked by the Americans to help, we have helped. And I made the point at the beginning of the program, you know, what are we thinking is going to happen if we're threatened by the Chinese? We just expect the Americans to go, oh, well, I know you didn't send a ship, but we'll come and save you. Well, they might send down a few clerks, a few clerks, and they can sit in, sit in Red Hill. And, uh, you know, we'll be able to say, well, that's that's great. You know, we've got a, we've got a whole heap of people straight out of West Point and they're operating computer screens in Red Hill. We're safe now. No, we'll want something a little bit more substantial than that, won't we? And that's why it's so very, very important that we are seen, not just we say we're a strong ally, but we act like a strong ally. And, it, the, Austra and the Australian people should know if we're not capable of sending a warship, that is, we don't have the crews or we don't have the, the platform, that is the actual warship, because, you know, we're just not able to send one well, the Australian people better know about that because that's a huge hole in our capacity as a nation to defend ourselves. Something very close to your heart I want to move on to, and that's uh, the Rural Fire Service. Sky did an excellent job yep. uh, on this yesterday. And the RFS, for some reason, is refusing to conduct an order into audit into its volunteer force. Now, John O'Lee found that the number of active volunteers ready to respond to a major fire could be less than half of what official documents claim. Take a listen to a little bit of what John O discovered here. The RFS told Sky News it had slipped to 71,000 members, of which 56,500 are operational. But two months ago, budget estimates was told a different figure. How many of those 70,000 are, um, you know, trained up to date and, and active and ready to actually uh, respond this summer? Make sure I give an accurate answer, but it's around 45,000 that are trained, ready to go. The commissioner's told Sky he has no interest in properly checking. And just to be clear, you don't want an audit to work out how many volunteers you got access to? No, because the volunteers can decide their own membership and tell us what it is. Barnaby, are you shocked by that? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is the Rural Fire Service is incredible. I mean, I, I live in a, a Rural Fire Service area. I mean, they're the people you get on the phone to and, and talk to if you've got a fire that breaks out, lightning strike, hits a, hits a tree, a couple of weeks later, breaks out, and, um, you know, it's your local people with their names emblazoned. You know, Woolbrook, Bolker, or Woolbrook, Bolker, Limbry, their names emblazoned on the side of their rig as they come out. Uh, so in our area, I don't know about the numbers, people are pretty good about um, attending to their duties and turning up. But it's, it sounds like a bit like the Defence Forces. The numbers on the book is not necessarily the numbers in the paddock. And uh, you know, I suppose we should get back, get to the bottom of it. But I, I don't want in any way, shape or form, to slight the Royal Fire Service, because without them, um, in my own personal experience, your place would burn down, your house would burn down. Uh, when all else fails, they're the ones that turn up in a big red truck to put out the fire. Well, let's hope you don't need it in your region over the Christmas period. Have a great Christmas uh, break, and we'll talk to you again next year, Barnaby. Thank you very much for that. Barnaby Joyce joining us there from Tamworth. Now, for more on the Red Sea saga, I'm joined by Deakin University Professor Greg Barton. Greg, I, I want to put the politics aside here and, and try and get a perspective on 
Why do you think the government made the call they did? Quickly with you, Steve. Look, the answer is we, we don't really know. And in a sense, the government can't really say it out loud, at least some of the reasons, because the suspicion is that part of the, the calculation may be resourcing. Um, the threat posed by the Houthis, this is a, a 100,000 strong militia, very sophisticated, um, very ruthless. They've been firing missiles uh, literally uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia for years into Saudi Arabia and Israel. So they, they can fire missiles uh, over a thousand kilometers and they have very lethal force in the Red Sea, which is which is their neighborhood. Uh, we only have three air warfare destroyers, the Hobart class vessels, uh, that are considered the, the best match for defending that sort of uh, aerial threat. Um, they're loaded up with sophisticated million dollar missiles, but you know, firing million dollar missiles at, at, uh, at drones possibly cost, costing thousands of dollars is a, an asymmetrical disadvantage, actually. And the fact we only have three of these vessels means sending one impacts on, on the duty cycle for the other two, because often with ships, you've got to have one in, in port for, for repairs and maintenance. So, the, the, you know, the cupboard's a bit bare. We're stretched thin. So that, I don't know that that's the reason for the decision, uh, but it's got to be a factor. And if you're in government, saying that out loud isn't a really wise thing. You, you, you don't want to... Um, be speaking about any uh, shortage of hardware. But so Richard Miles is in a difficult position. He's got to sort of put a, a positive face on, but perhaps behind the scenes, and this is not, not party political, for, for decades we, we haven't been building up our Navy to the, to the needs that we have of, of this current time. Barnaby made the, a very good point there, I think, Greg, where he said that you know, we're not going to defend something that is not pivotal to Australia. We're talking about a region of the world where a lot of our trade that ends up uh, particularly in the Middle East and Europe, and in the Middle East I'm thinking about, you know, perhaps live sheep export, uh, goats and, and all, of the, all of the above, it goes through that Red Sea area and through the Suez Canal, and so we're protecting our own export trade from these Houthi rebels, aren't we? Yeah, no, it's a fair point. There's, you know, one-eighth of world trade roughly goes through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, so it goes past that Bal Mandab um, choke point, which the Houthis are able to um, effectively threaten at the moment. Uh, so one eighth of world trade, that's that's a pretty substantial thing. And of course, it's one eighth of global trade. But for us, it's a larger proportion. You know, it it, it may be a long way from our um, territory, uh, but it's very immediate in terms of our national interest. Um, you and I don't have a lot of regard for the Global Times, that Chinese newspaper, which is pretty much a propaganda sheet. Uh, but I note that they were suggesting that China is celebrating, that they're praising Australia for distancing itself from the US. I mean, that would not be a good look. China had no influence on the decision, but they've jumped on board. Uh, I mean, seriously, have a listen to, to what Miles said about that. Whatever is being said there is, is whatever's being said, but it has absolutely no relationship to the, the decisions that we make. And I can tell you um, that, that, you know, our consultations are with a lot of countries. It ain't with China. Our consultations are with the United States first and foremost and with our like-minded partners. We seem, Greg, to be treading very gingerly around our issue and our relationship with the Chinese, don't we? Yeah, it's not just a question of, of diplomacy, Steve. It's also a question, we don't want to speak about our, our weaknesses, weaknesses that we can't easily remedy quickly. Um, so I understand that the Defence Minister doesn't want to say that, look, we've got a problem with the resourcing, so that's why we're, we're not wanting to commit a vessel. Uh, the Global Times, of course, is a propaganda piece. Um, absolutely, that, it's sort of very consistent. So in a sense, it's, it's kind of useful to keep an eye on the Global Times because it does tell us something about what Beijing wants to tell the world. Uh, of course, one of the ironies here, Steve, is that of that one-eighth of global trade passing through the Red Sea, quite a lot goes on to China and quite a lot of those Chinese vessels. Uh, we, a month ago, we had a vessel uh, hijacked by the Houthis. Um, unfortunately, that vessel is still in their control with a 25-member international crew. It wouldn't be at all surprising if one of the next victims of, of the Houthi attacks, and let's hope this is not the case, is a Chinese vessel. That would really change things. So... You know, there's, there's wheels within wheels here. I think China is actually very concerned because uh, the Red Sea uh, passage is very important to them and they've got a vulnerability there. So uh, I, I do think we need to think carefully about what we communicate. Um, but I, I, this is, you know, at the end of the day, this is a reminder that we don't have the force strength we'd like to have with, with naval assets, uh, whether we're talking about 
uh, threats in our immediate region, the Asia Pacific, or we're talking about trade routes like this that are vital to us. Now, great to catch up, Greg. Cheers, mate. Have a good Christmas now. After the break, I'll be joined by Evelyn Ray and James McPherson, and we'll tell you exactly how much of your money the federal government is spending, and I'll ask them whether it passes the pub test. This is the expenses on flights overseas. Plus, we'll get their predictions, big predictions for the year ahead. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Steve Price in for Andrew Bolt. I want to tell you uh, something shocking I saw in a major Melbourne shopping strip today involving a Palestinian protester. I'll give you some details on that when we talk about the ABC shortly. Before that, though, despite the PM, Anthony Albanese, preaching during the election campaign that his government would be, quote, more transparent, Parliamentary expenses documents released yesterday seem to prove otherwise. Now, these documents show federal MPs have spent $31 million with some single MPs spending tens of thousands of dollars on printing alone. I think that was a, a Victorian Liberal. It also revealed the Prime Minister himself spent nearly $4 million on VIP flights in just over 12 months. Joining me now is Sky News host James McPherson and Sky News contributor Evelyn Ray. Go to you first, James. I think we've got to be a little careful about things like Prime Ministerial costs on flights. Now, I think, like many people, that he went overseas too much, but we can't expect the PM to be sitting in, in a commercial plane. I, I don't have a problem with him going to the, the White House, for example, on a plane paid for by us. What about you? Sure. Well, I mean, Australians understand that our politicians are going to have expenses, as you've just mentioned. What we also expect, though, is we expect value for money. And I'd love to know whether Australians believe that $4 million in a year for Anthony Albanese to fly around the world, if you add his deputy at $6 million, do you reckon we got value for money? I mean, we got a rugby league team in Papua New Guinea. We got a defence treaty with Tuvalu in the Pacific. I'm not sure we got value for money. The other thing with this is it comes as a time where you and I are second-guessing every expense. I'm about to take my boys to Ballina for Christmas, but I promise you, before I booked the flights, I worked out, would it be more economical to drive? So we're second-guessing every expense. Meanwhile, Adam Bant, in May last year, spent $15,000 on one domestic flight from Canberra to Brisbane, which says to me they're not second-guessing their costs. What? They're just saying, oh, whatever it costs, just book it. And, and that's obscene when you consider that the economic predicament we're in is a result of their policies. How can you spend $15,000 flying from Canberra to Brisbane and back? I have no idea. What? Uh, Evelyn, I mean, I think the other person who might be saying, oh, did we get good value out of this might be US President Joe Biden, because Anthony Albanese flies off to Washington and has a state dinner with Joe. When Joe rings up and says, can we have a ship? They go, no. Oh, it's unbelievable, the politicians these days. It's it's rules for thee and not for me. But I think history shows that the bigger the government get, the smaller the citizen. And they're showing us just how small they think of us right now. And I think it was Chesterton who said it, and he got it right. Politicians should be local. They should be close enough to be able to kick them. Um, and, you know, something like this may seem like a small thing to some, but the bigger picture and the precedence here and the message that it sends is so important. The government do not own the people and the government don't, you know, we literally give them their jobs. We pay for them and they've got it. I think every now and then we need to give them a really big reality check and we need to remind them that the government work for the people, not the other way around. And things like this just put a wedge between government and citizen when there should be a better relationship here. And so things like this are just going to, you know, keep driving that wedge between us when more than ever we need to reunite as Australians um, and get our country working better again. And James, you've got to remember, of course, that Richard Miles, who we spoke about earlier in the program, when he goes flying on the uh, Prime Ministerial jet, his golf clubs are, are in the, the baggage <laughs> hole and he gets the plane to land at Avalon Airport, not at Tullamarine Airport, because it's closer to his home in Geelong. 
I know, I know. And it's stories like this, as Evelyn said, that just add to the mistrust and the, and the cynicism in the body politic. And that's not healthy for a functioning society. Our politicians need to be responsible and they need to realise it's not their money they're spending. I mean, I'm careful about my own money, but they're not even being careful about their own. It's our money that they're spending frivolously mm -hmm. at a time when, as I said, we're all being expected to tighten our belts. And so this should really be a wake-up call for them and we should see a change in behaviour. Speaking about our money being uh, spent badly, let's turn our attention to the ABC. I shouldn't laugh. Uh, they've sacked their morning radio show fill-in host, uh, someone called Antoinette Latouf, after numerous complaints about her commentary on the Israel-Gaza conflict, including this TikTok video, where she claims the video of pro-Palestinian protesters chanting, gas the Jews, outside the Opera House could be fake. Have a look. Viral footage of protesters chanting gas the Jews at the Opera House, but nobody can verify it's real. Here's a quick recap. The video was posted on October 10 by the Australian Jewish Association. The video is 59 seconds long. It's all wide shots with various edit points. Quotes are in inverted commas that have been captured, and it purports to show the large crowd chanting anti-Semitic tropes. No other social video, police body cam video, protester videos has gassed the Jews. So there are growing questions about who said it or whether anyone said it. And and importantly, where the video and audio came from. Just unbelievable stuff. She's since taken to social media, by the way, saying that she was terminated unlawfully and will consider legal options. I tell you who else, uh, Evelyn, should uh, be looking for a new job, and that would be the person in the ABC who thought it was a good idea to employ her to fill in on morning radio during the Christmas summer period. Yeah, look, I, to be honest, this might be a little bit controversial. I, I don't think people should lose their jobs for just showing support for Palestine. Like, I don't support Hamas. I don't support people singing Gas the Jews. I don't support anything anti-Semitic. But if she's merely showing support for innocent Palestinians who are dying in the crossfire, then we really shouldn't be mad about it. I think it's a very slippery slope if we start firing people for conversations and, and for things. But the problem that what we're seeing is... It, it, it's not as simple as that. And people are, are resorting to high school tactics and cowardly tactics in order to get their pro-Palestinian stance across. And that's what I don't like. And that's what leaves a really bad taste in my mouth because any support that they would have gained for their cause is immediately lost when you do these ridiculous things. There were eyewitnesses who were there. Uh, you might not have a video, but there are plenty of eyewitnesses who heard it themselves, who experienced it themselves at the Opera House. So it, it's a closed cut case i'm a detective sealed found guilty let's move on and let's stop getting into these sort of wild conspiracy theories but you know it's a very unintelligent and silly thing for her to do um but again like i said i think it's the absence of objectivity and debate that's the language of the oppressor so i'm just mindful in all of this war situation and what's happening in the middle east to not fit into that shoe i don't want to be one of those people who censors people look as i said if if you're inciting something if you're defaming, if you're slandering, let, let's get rid of that. But if, if you're just showing your support for Palestine, just like people are showing their support for people in Israel, all the innocent people who are stuck there, I have no problem with that. Well, that's all well and good, Evelyn. Uh, James, what this uh, woman has done, of course, has broken every code of conduct from the ABC. I mean, she's broken all of their social media codes of conduct. And ABC presenters, uh, James, and I take your point, Evelyn, ABC presenters are told that they're not to have opinions. That's what the ABC charter says. James, she's just broken every rule in the book, hasn't she? Yeah, I take a different view on this to Evelyn. I think the ABC were absolutely right to sack her. The ABC is responsible to be um, impartial and unbiased, and the only way they can do that is if their presenters are seen to be impartial. And this is not this particular journalist's only offence. She was one of a number of ABC journalists who signed a letter calling for Hamas to be treated the same as Israel in news reporting, which is ridiculous. Hamas are a terror organisation. So she already did that. And then on top of that, to suggest that gas the Jews was not said when we've all heard it with our own ears, and then to host a radio program, no one would trust her 
to not bring her own biased views against Israel, supporting Hamas onto her radio program. So the ABC were right to do this. And frankly, it's about time the ABC held their journalists to account and told them to stop being activists, either be a journalist or if you want to be an activist, go somewhere else and do it. They made the right decision. Yeah, I take your point entirely, Evelyn, but, I mean, you've got to play by the rules of the people who are employing you, and that's what that was a mistake she made. If she wanted to resign from the ABC and go and be an activist like that, well, that's well and good. I want to tell you both, uh, I was in Chapel Street in Melbourne today, and uh, I nearly got run over by a guy on one of those electric bikes like the food delivery people uh, uh, use. This guy had the largest Palestinian flag you've ever seen, uh, riding down the middle of a retail shopping strip three days or four days before Christmas uh, at breakneck speed. I mean, we are getting to a point where the community, Evelyn, is completely fractured here. You've got claims of anti-Semitism and you've got someone running around doing that. It's not very sensible. No, it's not. And, and, you know, like I agree with James's point as well about, um, you know, that they, ABC made the right decision. But the thing is, they never have. So why all of a sudden now is my question. Um, like, was this the straw that broke the camel's back? And why? I think there's been far worse things that the ABC have done before this. But I digress. Exactly what you said. It's so divisive what is happening right now. And this is, I guess, one of those consequences of a multicultural nation. We have so many people from so many different backgrounds. So we're going to see things like this happening as much as we don't like it. I think that as we're leading into Christmas, like, why don't you throw down your warmongering flags? Why don't you give it up? And why don't we just try to get in the festive Christmas spirit? And why don't we pray for the innocent souls that are stuck in the Middle East on either side who are going to be stuck in this crossfire? I, I think, like I mentioned before, the tactics that I'm seeing a lot of the pro-Palestinian people do is losing so much sympathy for their cause. I don't like it. I don't buy it. I'm not interested in it. Um, but if I was ever going to be interested in it, they're not going to win me over by these silly tactics, flying flags in retail. People want to go shopping. They don't want to go there for social justice causes. Yeah, well said. I want to tap into both of you about what we might be seeing in 2024. I'll get a couple of predictions in a moment. But the best and worst of uh, 2023, I'll go to you first, James. I'll give you mine. The best news I got in 2023, and I know, James, you'll love this, was when Daniel Andrews decided to re re <laughs> retire and quit. That was the best bit of news I have ever had. Uh, I do think the worst news we've had, obviously, is the horror out of the Middle East. That's just dreadful. What do you reckon, James? What was the best thing for you in 2023? Well, I mean, I thought I knew what was the best thing, but then you mentioned Dan Andrews, and now I'm second-guessing my choice. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to go, as a close runner, uh, Steve, uh, the referendum being defeated. I think that was a great thing that happened this year. It was great for Australian democracy that we didn't insert race into the Constitution, and it was great for Australian citizens that they avoided being bullied by... I mean, every corporation, every politician, every sporting body, every celebrity was all pushing, you must vote yes, and the the Australian uh, public proved that they won't be bullied. I thought that was a really great result. In terms of the worst thing this year, it, you can't go past what happened on October 7, but to localise it, the response no. here in Australia to the slaughter of Jews has horrified me and uh, is the worst thing I have seen in this country in a long time and is quite frightening for our future. That, that to me, was the worst thing that happened this year by a mile. Evelyn, I'll just get your best of 2023 because I know you're a, a sunny, optimistic person. What was the best thing you saw and what happened this year? Oh, look, definitely the unveiling and the unravelling of the COVID narrative. I mean, I think vindication is on the taste of all of our mouths who stood up against the draconian lockdowns and the fact that we're vindicated now that all these mainstream results are coming through, that we were right, that was victorious and glorious. Evelyn Ryan, James McPherson, have a great Christmas, both of you. Thank you very much for helping me out on the Bolt Report tonight. Now, coming up after the break, we talk about cost of living a lot. The crisis it rages on. More and more Australian families are being forced to ask for help this Christmas. Find out how you can help brighten up this festive period for those uh, who are struggling. I'll be joined by the Salvos, Brendan Nottle, up next. 
Welcome back to Steve Price in for Andrew Bolt. Chris Kenny coming up. Now, Christmas is often referred to as the most wonderful time of the year, but I can tell you for millions and millions of Australians, this could not be further from the truth. The cost of living crisis rages on, new research, and these figures are horrifying. 40 million Australians, 14, will be significantly impacted these holidays, and almost one in 10 will rely on charitable support to get by this Christmas. A man who does a wonderful job in Melbourne, Victoria, is the Salvation Army's Major Brendan Nottle, who joins me now. Brendan, so nice to see you again. Your Christmas appeal's up and running. How vital is that for so many people that you can raise some money? Oh, it's absolutely critical, Steve. I've been doing this work for 32 years and I've never, ever seen the demand for our services like we're seeing at the moment. So the Salvation Army conducted national research and they found that 48% of people that are presenting to Salvation Army services across the country are actually doing so for the very first time. And we're seeing one in seven parents that were surveyed saying they're not sure if they'll be able to put a meal on the table for their family and gifts under the Christmas tree for their kids this Christmas Day. So you, you hear that and you think, gosh, is this is this really Australia? Uh, and, and I think what we're seeing, uh, Steve, is not just the, the data, not just the stats, but we're actually seeing flesh on that data every single day. So we're actually seeing cues of people that we haven't seen before coming in for our service, and that's being replicated right across the country. We're talking, Brendan, there about working poor, aren't we? Oh, no question, Steve. So last Tuesday night, I was in our cafe that we run here in Melbourne and uh, a mum came in with two little kids, one two, one four, and dad was off working and they simply can't make ends meet. So what we're seeing, Steve, is people now, families are having to make decisions about do they pay the rent, do they pay the mortgage, do they put meals on the table, do they pay utilities, do they pay medical bills or do they have Christmas? And for a lot of people that I'm seeing each day, they're actually putting a line through Christmas this year because they're simply saying we can cannot make ends meet when it comes to doing all of these things. So for the first time, for a lot of them, they're having to make decisions about what they're going to cut. And we're seeing those people come to our service, but services similar to ours right across the country, because they just can't make ends meet. And I think, you know, when you do this stuff, when you do this work, Steve, uh, for a long time, and, and you see the look on people's faces, it's a look of embarrassment, it's a look of shame, because a lot of these people previously have donated to organisations like ours, and all of a sudden they find themselves in a place where they have to queue up and open their hands and say, we need to receive from you, and they find it overwhelming and really hard. And I have to say, I find that overwhelming too. You and I have known each other a long time. Um, is this as bad as you've seen it? I've never seen anything like this, Steve. So I'd say this is unprecedented, what we're seeing at the moment. And the concern for us is, is this begin the beginning of a downward spiral here for us as a country? Because the economic uncertainty, the cost of living pressures that are impacting so many Australians, and you mentioned it before, 14 million people are stressed. So our research indicated 62% of Australians are feeling really stressed financially at this time of the year that's not going to end on January the 1st, 2024. And we believe that it will continue and will we'll continue to need support uh, going forward into the new year. And the reality is, like, with Australians, they're really quite incredible. So we're hearing the story about Australians are really feeling the pinch at all levels of society. But we're seeing this mountain of toys being donated to the Salvation Army and other organisations. So people feeling the pinch, but knowing there's somebody doing it worse off than them and they're wanting to help, which, which I just think is fantastic. And we need to remember that it's not just Christmas where people need help, but it's beyond Christmas where people need our support as well. Yeah, the Salvos do a fantastic job right around the country. How can people donate if they want to? How can they help? Well, there's a couple of ways, Steve. I think one is 13 salvos. So if people pick up the phone and ring that number, whatever donation yep. they can make would be really gratefully appreciated by us. Or th uh, salvationarmy.org.au is the other way. And I just want to say, I just really want to encourage your viewers, Steve, to just um, lift up your eyes at this time of the year. It's easy to get caught up in the busyness of the year. But lift up your eyes to your neighbour, exactly. uh, to your family members, uh, to your work colleagues, and just check in. And just make yep. sure they're OK, because it's not just financial stress. It's also people feeling disconnected at this time of the year. And we want to make sure that we wrap our arms around everybody that's doing it tough. 
Well said, uh, Brendan. You do a w wonderful job. Thanks for joining us. That's my last show of the year. I'll be back with you in 2024. Chris Kenny's up next.